Uh, it's very nice to be here in Seattle. I was last here in 1999 on my honeymoon when I was uh, 22. And uh, the weather was beautiful the entire time. And then I came in yesterday and the weather was beautiful and I began to think this whole rainy Seattle thing was like a myth. Um, but it turns out it's not. I thought maybe Seattle and Seattle knows something. I don't know what you call it. Okay. I thought maybe you did what we do in Colorado, which is we tell everybody that the weather's terrible so they won't move there and uh, make the place more crowded. But uh, it seems it does rain here, apparently, at least some of the time. But nevertheless, I'm sad. I won't have more time to spend here. Uh, but uh, I do hope to be back uh, before too long because it is a very nice city. Now, I've uh, been asked to speak about uh, some other myths related to the campaign this year. And uh, uh, we could spend all kinds of time on uh, various other myths, but uh, we'll try and uh, fit in uh, uh, as many as we can here for the, for the next few minutes. And uh, specifically, there's three areas that I want to focus on. Um, uh, th three uh, th three uh, categories of myths, I suppose, is uh, what you could call them. Now, the first one is this idea that uh, has been floating around the campaigns, especially with the Bernie Sanders campaign, uh, and to a lesser extent with Hillary. And uh, there's this idea that uh, uh, the United States spends very little money on uh, social benefits. And uh, this is something that a lot of people believe, that the United States is kind of this uh, highly capitalistic, social Darwinist country uh, with virtually no uh, safety net whatsoever. And that just this tiny amount of money goes to, uh, to social benefits programs. Um, that, is, that is not true. Uh, it, it turns out that the United States is actually uh, very similar to uh, European countries and uh, to the other countries in the Anglosphere, like Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and so on. And, and by the way, uh, uh, all of this information that I'll be quoting has been covered in previous articles by me at uh, Mises.org. And so when I do a text version of this on the site, I'll include links to all this information that you can look at in more detail. Um, so uh, yeah, there's, there's much deeper information behind all of this, and I'll show you where you can get it uh, later on the website. But let's just look at the US and compare its social policies to other countries. There's, uh, there's no way that we can make the case that the US uh, does not spend a lot of money on social benefits. In fact, if we just look at the percentage of the GDP that is spent on social benefits from country to country, we find that it's more or less the same. For example, the United States spends about 18% governments in the United States, so we're talking about government spending, direct to government spending, is about 18% of GDP. And it's about 19% in Norway. And uh, so what's the big difference there? It's about 19-20% uh, in New Zealand. It, uh, once you start to get closer to, say, France and uh, a couple other big spending countries, they get up to maybe 22-23% in terms of the GDP they spend on uh, on social benefits. And this isn't just government spending, mind you. This is things like retirement, health care, social security, and so on. So there's just not that big a, uh, a spread there. It goes from about 22% down to about 17%. Down at the low end, you find Australia and Canada and Iceland, which are all below the United States in terms of social benefit spending. Of course, we're, uh, and we've all been told on multiple occasions that uh, that Canada is this, this paradise of equality to the north. Um, that maybe that is, but they managed to do it by spending less government money. And uh, so the, the US just simply should not be viewed as this, this odd man out on these issues. Many other fallacies in terms of economic debate then proceed from this, that we need to spend more on this or that, the other thing, just so the US can start to, to be more humane uh, like the other countries out there in Europe and in, uh, and in uh, Australia, for example. And uh, if it may be that there are other changes that could be made uh, in order to address some of these issues that people on the left uh, think need to be done, but I can tell you that the, the problem is not that there is not enough government spending that's going to these programs. We can look also at this in terms of just health care. More specifically, if we look at health care spending, specifically government spending on health care, not just people in general, not the private sector, we find that the U.S. is number four in the world in terms of spending on health care. The only countries that spend mo more are Switzerland, Luxembourg, and Norway. 
And uh, those tend to be very wealthy countries as well. And the people there can uh, tend to afford more in health care. But the, all the spending on health care, uh, it's, it's, it's again a myth that the U.S. isn't spending a lot on it in terms of government spending. Now, interestingly, of course, the left will also use this as an, exam, uh, as an example of why healthcare spending is bad in America. Look how much America spends on healthcare spending. If we would just adopt Bernie Sanders' healthcare plan, then the U.S. would spend hundreds of billions of dollars less on healthcare. But of course, we can't have it both ways. We can't have so much healthcare spending. Uh, we can't have healthcare spending in America be an example of both how America spends too little in terms of government benefits, and then at the same time have all of its high amounts of spending be simultaneously an example of how the U.S. shouldn't have to spend that much. So which is it? In fact, if we look at the overall amounts of spending, we find that Denmark is right next to the United States. And so you will have people say that, oh, look how much America spends on healthcare spending in terms of government benefits. Clearly, we need some major overhaul in the healthcare system. And then in the next breath, they'll tell us how Denmark does everything so wonderfully uh, in terms of its healthcare welfare system. So which is it? If Denmark's spending about the same amount on healthcare as the United States in terms of government spending, how come that's okay, but it's not okay the way the U.S. Uh, government spends on healthcare spending? So what we find when we start to look into this data is that there's just not that big a difference there. It's, there's lots of government spending going on. In fact, if we look at how much uh, the U.S. spends when we look at uh, tax policy, which is designed to help people with children, designed to help people keep more of their money uh, rather than pay it in in taxes, once you take all that into account, when you start to incorporate American tax policy that's designed to help lower-income people, what you find is the U.S. is actually number two in the world in terms of policies designed to assist the poor in terms of helping them keep more of their income rather than direct spending. So we should just need to get over the idea that uh, the U.S. isn't spending a lot of money through its government programs on health care. If people want to debate over some different way to do things or some sort of change in the program, then uh, that doesn't even really interest me that much. That's fine. Maybe some of those ideas could, you could make a good case for them. But those changes can be made without a need for any additional tax revenue or any, uh, any greater spending, because the U.S. is already spending more than quite a few countries on its social benefits. So any sort of program that, any sort of idea where uh, someone like Bernie comes out and says, well, we're going we're gonna to overhaul the program and it's going to save us billions of dollars, but first we just need to spend another 50 billion more, another 100 billion more, another 500 billion more, and then we can come back and then we'll actually spend less later down the road. But we're going to have to spend more up front and then we'll spend more later. Well, obviously you shouldn't fall for that because it's, you're never going to get to that point where the spending goes down again. So if we just compare the U.S. to other countries, there's no lack of uh, spending on benefits and uh, we should just proceed accordingly. Uh, certainly, it would be great to argue that, those, uh, that that overall spending should be cut, but certainly, if we can make the comparisons, there is absolutely no case that could be made for the claim that the U.S. just simply isn't spending much. So no, the United States is not some kind of uh, uh, capitalistic paradise where we're all keeping all of our money and, uh, and the poor people are getting what they deserve or whatever the caricature is of uh, capitalists. Um, that's just simply not the case. And really, the U.S. should be looked at more of just like all of these other social, de social democratic countries. A lot of spending going on, tons of government programs. And we, and we don't even have time to go into the realities of poverty in the United States in terms of air conditioning, in terms of cell phones, in terms of automobile ownership, and all of those things that the poor have in the United States that uh, they do not have uh, in other places, especially in Southern Europe, where a middle-class lifestyle would be living in a two-bedroom apartment without air conditioning and raising your family there. Uh, the reality here is much, much different. What you find has almost a religious tinge to it where you try to argue that uh, the U.S. is really just not something special. It's not this odd man out. It's not this uh, uh, extremely stingy, miserly uh, country where, uh, where nobody's paying out anything in government benefits. Once you start to challenge that, people become very upset. And, uh, and it's, it's living on in the, uh, the current uh, election cycle. Now, so this, of course, relates to the, uh, the poverty issue. And this is where we see some of the, the most long-lived and, uh, and die-hard myths 
coming about. Another, the, uh, the second group of myths are those related to the fact that uh, we're told we need government to protect us uh, from the cruelty of uh, market economics. And uh, this can take many forms. We need, uh, we need government, of course, to, to give us retirement. Uh, we, have, we have government to thank for, for creating the weekend. This is a, uh, an often repeated thing. If it weren't for government regulation of the workplace, we'd all be working 80 hours for essentially subsistence wages. But fortunately, we have progressive governments that force the government to pay us what we're worth, and that force the government to give us weekends and vacations, that force the government to give us uh, time off to spend with our families, maybe uh, family leave, which is a big plank of Hillary right now that we're going to mandate more uh, family leave for people. And of course, the Obama administration just came out with uh, uh, tighter regulations on the use of, of overtime pay, essentially making it so that more, fewer people who traditionally would be salaried are now going to have to be paid more in overtime. Of course, we all have been told a million times that if we didn't have government doing those things, uh, we'd all be working long, long hours for, uh, for next to nothing. Now, of course, that's not true at all. The reason that we're not working hours as much as our great-grandparents were, or even our grandparents, uh, is because of worker productivity being very high. Now, Walter didn't have time to get to this, uh, but that's the flip side of the minimum wage. If we're going to talk about wages, how do we bring up wages? Well, you can't just set the wage. In order to make it feasible, you have to actually increase worker productivity. And the way you do that is by labor-saving machines, uh, by making it possible for people to produce more value in less time. And that's the only way that you can actually make a society richer. Obviously, you can't just simply declare that everybody's going to be wealthier in the future. You need to come up with some way to make that happen. And since the Industrial Revolution, we've been pretty good at that uh, as, as a species, using machinery, using devices to help us produce more. Now, a simple example would, uh, would be in, uh, I used to be a janitor for six years, so let's use a janitorial example. Now, uh, in the olden days of janitorial, you had the little, the floor buffer that has the spinning brush on the bottom. Now, in the older days, those would only spin at like 80, 100 uh, RPM. And that was very, very slow, very, very time consuming. It took you forever to polish a floor. Now, in more recent decades, however, they've developed the high-speed burnisher, which uh, rotates at hundreds of uh, RPM and allows you to, uh, say, polish an entire gym floor, if you will, in minutes compared to hours before. Now, just think about what this means then for your average janitor, is now they can do two or three of these floors in the same time they would have taken to do one before. Now, the outcome of that, of course, is he now can make much higher wages. He can go from place to place, uh, doing more and less time, charging not as much as he could before, probably, because now other people will have those burnishers as well, and there will be some competition to bid down the price. However, overall, the effect will be that janitors will be able to simply do more work in less time, they'll be able to do more of it, and the other upside of that will be that more people will have cleaner floors more of the time at a lower price. That's the only way that we can really actually increase the wages and the lifestyle of, in this case, janitors who use that equipment. We've introduced some capital, which, by the way, was made possible by the savings and capital accumulation of people in the past who were able to put money into an entrepreneur developing that equipment. Janitors use that equipment, they make more money, and they become wealthier. Simply declaring that we should all pay janitors 20 bucks an hour would not accomplish that and would not make it possible and certainly not sustainable in any way. The only way to increase wages is by increasing worker productivity. And it's not just wages, of course. It, this allows us to just have a higher standard of living in general. It allows us to work fewer hours. Tom Woods and I did an episode of his show a little while back where we talked about how just having more jobs doesn't necessarily mean that we're getting richer any more than also just working more hours in a week doesn't mean we're getting richer. Now, it can mean that. Um, and so I think under current conditions, you can make the case that you do, in fact, need to add jobs in order to show uh, some, some gains in the economy. However, over time, especially if we look at over, say, 30 years in the past or 50 years in the past or 80 years in the past, our ancestors worked longer hours in most cases. 
and they certainly had a lower standard of living because of it. The, only, the reason that they were able to work fewer hours over time, the reason that we don't have to slave in the field uh, like our farmer ancestors did or work long hours in a highly dangerous factory is due to the benefits of increases in worker productivity. And that creates uh, extra uh, money, creates uh, this uh, wiggle room, if you will, because now workers are so productive and creates more profit and creates higher standard of living for everyone that workers can work less. It also gives their employers more extra money in order to make the workplace safer and to do a lot of things that actually make worse work less onerous, less time consuming and better overall. So when people tell us that we should be thanking for the government for the weekends, we should be thanking the fact that we can earn enough to live a, li a nice lifestyle now in 40 hours a week, whereas our ancestors could only do that in 60 or 70 hours a week in many cases. It wasn't simply because the government declared now that uh, we're going to work fewer hours. If in the 13th century a king had simply declared we're going to work fewer hours now, that would have just meant more people would have starved to death. The reason we can work fewer hours and not starve to death is because worker productivity is so high. So we need to stop, of course, ceding that, uh, that whole premise uh, to the activists who want to come in and make the claim that work life will simply be better if we start regulating more. The reality, of course, is that what we really need to do is help entrepreneurship and help people produce more in less time. And then the final myth is this issue that markets make things more expensive and we need the government to make everything more affordable. And we see that now in a variety of areas. Uh, we see it in housing, healthcare, and higher education uh, is where most of the debate has been uh, featuring lately in uh, higher ed and healthcare especially. Now the problem is, of course, that virtually everything that the government does when it claims to be making things more affordable and more available is actually to increase the price of goods and services and to make them less accessible to people. And then what they do is they come back and they say, well, we'll give you more money, we'll subsidize your income, or we'll subsidize healthcare, and that will then make you able to access it. Whereas, of course, it would be far more efficient uh, to simply allow the market to work to bring down the cost of things, because that's, of course, what naturally happens in the marketplace, is the price of goods and services come down. That's why we pay less uh, now for many electronics, of course, which is relatively unregulated. But of course, to build a car with the same amenities that a car had in 1960 would be far, far less expensive today. Now, we added all kinds of stuff to cars that makes them more expensive now. But if we didn't add all that and didn't have all of these smog check requirements and all of that, you could purchase a car for next to nothing and certainly for a much tinier percentage of your income than your grandfather could. And so the goal should be always to lower the price of goods and services, not to regulate them and not to subsidize them, which only increases and brings up the price of health care. And we saw this uh, a lot in a recent debate uh, between uh, policymakers over higher ed, where Paul Campos, a law professor at the uh, University of Colorado, uh, pointed out that it is, it is absolutely not true, and now Campos isn't exactly a free market guy, but he was ne nevertheless honest enough to point out that uh, higher ed is not more expensive because there's less government spending going into it. Now, all the data shows quite clearly that there's more government spending now than ever on higher education. The reason it's more expensive is because it is so heavily subsidized that it creates more demand for the product and the price continues to go up. Now at some point then you need to start rationing uh, in order to keep prices down. That's the only way to keep prices down. The market either rations it in terms of only providing certain services to people who can't, who can't afford it or it actively rations it in terms of the government only allowing you so many services that you can use. Now, the Germans have free education, but they ration it heavily through the use of tests. You're only allowed to go to higher ed if you qualify through a uh, regime of government tests, and other countries do this as well. The U.S., of course, lets you go to college um, regardless of who you are, is very open with that, and that tends to push prices up quite a bit, but that is a direct result of the subsidy. The same is true in housing, both in for purchase and for rent housing, where there's both through Section 8, where they subsidize the renter, and that allows then uh, renters to, uh, or it allows the landlords then to demand more money because the rent is being subsidized, partially subsidized by the government. And of course, 
Uh, home ownership is constantly being subsidized by a wide array of government programs, Fannie, Freddie, FHA, and so on, that help drive up the price of home ownership as well. But all the while that all this is going on and all the price of these basic things that we need to buy every day, we're being told that somehow magically the market is making all of these things more expensive, whereas this, the mechanism's never quite explained. Or if they do manage to come up with something in the market that shows why something's becoming more expensive there, then they just leave out the fact that a huge portion of the market is being subsidized. Uh, the, and of course, healthcare, as we noted in the first part, is heavily subsidized as well uh, through all of its massive amounts of spending, which of course makes the US the fourth in the world in terms of government spending. So through all of this, then we're just supposed to sit back and watch the debates as all of these myths are repeated again and again. The market is, is our enemy because it makes things more expensive or does nothing to uh, help us afford things, but fortunately the government will step in to do that. Uh, when, and then we're left, of course, with this idea that, uh, that the U.S. is somehow unique and more heartless than other places, and none of that is true. And unfortunately, it doesn't look like those myths are going to go away anytime soon. They were around four years ago, eight years ago, uh, and even more so, actually, in periods in the past. And they're coming back full time now. And you're not even seeing any sort of substantial debate about it. Uh, I don't think we'll see any kind of real debate over Social Security or in any real cutbacks to health spending or anything like that. And so I suppose it's now helpful to know about these things, and maybe uh, at some future election cycle, we might see a, uh, a more rational treatment of these things. But until then, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for being here.